The dark tunnels of the mine twist and turn every which way. Without a guide, you could end up lost down here and never find your way back to the surface. This is why it was so worrisome when the dwarf prospector we had hired to lead the way mentioned that he had never seen this passageway before. My gut told me that dead or alive, this is where we would find those missing miners. And as we approached that tenebrous opening, the silence of the mine was broken by a clamor of bones undulating against rock. A horror unlike anything I've ever laid eyes upon approached quickly. In the dim torchlight we could see shreds of cloth and what remained of those we had come searching for scattered across the floor. We would have to fight lest we join the poor souls we were sent to save. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig into D&D's past and find creatures that have been long forgotten by history and game designers and bring them to 5th edition for you to use in your current D&D campaign. I'm your host Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be taking a look at something that I get a lot of requests for. Something I see requested on almost every video I put up is more low level creatures, like creatures that are CR3 or less that are usable for pretty much brand new parties just starting out. This is tough because what makes it worth it for me to convert a creature into 5th edition from a past version of D&D is that I want it to have unique abilities, so something that you won't necessarily find already in 5th edition, and I also like for it to have some interesting history or lore attached to it, or at least have the capacity for us to make some. Now there are tons of monsters like that that are CR5 and above, but if you're DMing for a lower level party, that doesn't really help you out too much. So this week I made it my mission to go out there and find something specifically that was CR3 or less and I think I found something you'll be very interested in. Now we have a bunch of undead and D&D already, but for lower level creatures that aren't ghosts, you're pretty much limited to zombies and skeletons. Maybe an ogre zombie if your party's feeling particularly bold. Now today's creature is skeletal and it is CR3, so it's still usable for those lower level adventures, but it's unlike anything your party is likely to have ever seen before. The Serpentier is a creature created by Foul Necromancy, using components from many different bodies, creating this 30 foot long, two headed, elongated monstrosity. Its many ribs act like the legs of a millipede or other insectile creature and it skitters along the ground, kind of like an undead terrifying cat dog that is driven by a pure desire for destruction and death. And it has some of the most interesting and unique abilities I've seen for a creature of this level in a long time. It originally comes to us from the fifth monster manual that they ever put out for Dungeons and Dragons 3.5. It's definitely one of those creatures that's worth taking note of and kind of stashing away for the next time you're starting out a new game, or if you happen to be DMing a lower level game right now, I guarantee you'll find this useful. So today we're going to talk about just what this thing can do in battle, and then of course we'll talk about some ways you can actually use it in your game. So clutch those holy symbols tight because it's time for... First and foremost, in case it wasn't already obvious, this creature is in fact undead, which means it's going to be immune to poison damage, being poisoned, it's going to be resistant to cold, and of course it's not going to be able to be put to sleep because it doesn't sleep. And it is also vulnerable to bludgeoning because it's much easier to smash a skeleton to bits with a club than it is to stab them to death with a sword. Now this creature is 30 feet long which means it's large and it uses its size to full effect. Despite how big they are though they are also extremely mobile. They have a move speed of 50 so they can run around or skitter around whatever word you want to use there extremely fast and they have a climb speed of 30 so they can climb around the walls and ceilings just as fast as most normal creatures can move regularly. And that climb speed comes in super handy when it's trying to stalk prey within its own lair. Because if it can stick up on the ceiling and stalk people from the shadows rather than have to actually be close by on the ground, it's going to be much more effective, especially in an area with high ceilings. And it is also two-headed, so much like the Etten, it has that ability called two-headed. This gives the creature advantage on perception checks, saves against being blinded, charmed, stunned, basically anything that would give you advantage if you had two heads. And as far as actual attacks go, it has multi-attack and one melee attack it can make called Grasping Claw. It can make two Grasping Claw attacks every turn, and it only does about a d6 worth of damage, so it's not going to be too detrimental. However, if both claw attacks hit the same target, that target is then grappled by the Serpentier. Now this is important, because if a creature is in fact grappled by a Serpentier, as a bonus action, the Serpentier can take that creature and jam them into the many different rib cages they have connecting and start churning them to bits basically with their churning ribs ability. 
Now when a creature is stuck inside of the churning ribs of a Serpentier, it takes 2d8 piercing damage at the beginning of the Serpentier's turn every single time. The creature is also considered grappled, but because the Serpentier doesn't have to be holding them anymore, it's now stuck within their body, it's more like they're swallowed, as the Serpentier's hands are free to attack and do other things like normal. This also means that their move speed is not inhibited by the fact that this creature is now within them being torn to shreds. And as far as that creature goes, they're not restrained, they're just grappled, so they can still make attack rolls against the Serpentier. But if they want to try to use their action to escape, they're going to need a DC 16 athletics check. If they don't escape, whether because they failed their check or they just haven't made the attempt to escape, they're going to just be dragged along wherever the Serpentier goes. And this kind of plays in with the tactics that the Serpentier employs as kind of a stealthy hunter. It's fond of just watching a party and kind of waiting for a good opportunity to strike at what it perceives as the weakest party member, grabbing them, putting it in its ribs and starting to chew them to bits basically, and then just retreating back to the darkness or getting as far away from the party as it can. And if given the chance, it can hold up to two medium-sized creatures within its ribs at once. So this can be pretty fearsome for a low-level party if two of their party members get trapped within one of these things and are being chewed to bits while they're unable to escape. However, it does have one final ability that really sets it apart from pretty much anything else you'll find, at least in the 5th edition monster manual. As a being who is essentially two creatures stuffed into one, it gets a trait that very, very few monsters throughout D&D history have ever had the pleasure of getting. This trait is called Dual Actions. The only other creature that I've covered that has this trait is the Chrono Tyrant, and if you have seen that video or you remember that one from about a year ago, this trait is still as nasty now as it was then. Essentially what this does is it allows the Serpentier to take two of every action. It gets two regular actions, two bonus actions, and two reactions. This opens up a ton of possibilities because that allows this creature to move, then grab someone, and then with its second action it can use the dash action and move back away. Or if it really needs to make lots of attacks, it can use both of its actions to do multi-attack and attack with four claws, and only two of those have to hit in order for it to grapple someone, so even if two of them miss, as long as those last two connect, it's still going to be able to grab someone and put them within their ribs. And if they get lucky and all four attacks hit two separate creatures, they can instantly grab two different creatures. If it's already grasping onto some prey, it can then move, use a dash action, and then use another dash action to run extremely fast, like three times its move speed, back into wherever it wants to go in its lair. It should have an option for almost any situation, and just the idea of a creature that can manipulate the action economy like this so freely should be terrifying to your players because it is kind of terrifying. So as you can see, these guys aren't just about looking freaky, they can back it up with actions. Two of them, in fact. So let's move on to some ways we can actually use this crawling terror in our games with some... The first Serpentiers were originally created by the Skull Lords, who in the older lore of D&D were a group of powerful necromancers, and they were cursed with an immeasurable desire to feed on living creatures. I imagine that this curse was placed upon the Serpentiers because they were intended to be used as powerful weapons. This unfortunately backfired and made the Serpentier extremely hard to control. The creatures were driven mad by this near insatiable hunger and constantly fed on the living only to watch their shredded meals fall through their open ribs. Because of this, unlike a lot of other raised or created undead, they are in fact chaotic. But that said, they aren't stupid. They might not have a high intelligence score, but they hunt on instinct. They will meticulously watch and stalk a group or single target until the time is right for them to strike. Because of this, and the fact they don't really have many options when it comes to ranged combat, they tend to haunt old tombs and mines and dungeons, uh, places underground where this creature can make full use of its stealthy abilities and won't really have to worry about engaging in too much ranged conflict. As a random encounter, you could throw this creature at a party that's venturing in any real underground passageway like I just described. You could have pretty much any random dungeon that this creature could just pop up in because undead tend to pop up in the weirdest of places, as we all know. If you wanted more of an actual adventuring hook, maybe a group of dwarvish miners have been mining out this mountain on the side of their small town for months now. And after some time, they broke through into what appeared to be another network of tunnels, some ancient dungeon or possibly just an ancient mine that had been sitting there for a very long time. Maybe it connects to the Underdark in some way or another. 
At any rate, there was a Serpentier inside of that old mine that had been trapped in there due to a cave-in, and is now set free to feed upon the miners. So the miners start going missing, disappearing, and the noble who owns the mine hires the party to go and investigate, see what is taking away my miners, are they running off, are they being killed by something, is someone else paying them more than what I'm willing to pay them, what's going on? So the party goes in to investigate and see what's happening. This could make a great adventure for a group just starting out. Imagine they're level 1 and they travel through the mines, they fight some Sturges, some other minor insectile creatures or other minor undead that also escaped through and from the catacombs when they were opened up, and then the Serpentier is the final boss who they encounter around level 2, maybe 3. The other thing your party members will probably love is that these creatures' lairs are often littered with treasure. A Serpentier doesn't place any value on material wealth, but that doesn't mean it doesn't accrue it by accident. They might find old weapons or bits of jewelry wedged between the ribs of a fallen Serpentier, and after some time these things certainly would shake themselves loose from its bone structure, so maybe there are bits of jewelry and coins or whatever just kind of scattered around a wide area in the Serpentier's lair, all remnants of creatures it once fed upon. These guys can also be a valuable asset to any just general undead force. Say you have a villain in your game who's raising undead or using undead in a combative capacity, a Serpentier can just be another undead that you add to bolster the ranks of this person. It doesn't necessarily have to have a huge significance behind it, it can just be some variety within the undead ranks of a bad guy. If you want to get a bit more creative with it, maybe a Serpentier is like a pet for a higher level enemy. Something like a vampire. Maybe a vampire has created or dominated a Serpentier that they found, and brought them into their service. Perhaps she keeps it as a pet in her noble baronry and enjoys feeding the peasants to it to amuse herself. If you're running an adventure like Curse of Strad that involves a vampire, they are very good at dominating other creatures, so this could be something just to add a little bit more flavor or something more memorable to drop into the mansion or any dungeon, really. I kind of like the idea that Strad would have a Serpentier just roaming around his house the same way you would have a dog. Or a cat. Like a skeletal cat dog. Did I already make that joke? But again, sticking to the low-level theme here, perhaps in the starting town or wherever your adventurers are getting their beginnings, there's a low-level necromancer who is experimenting with some ancient tomes that he found. Across town, graves are being dug up, and there are very specific body parts missing. Two arms from this one, two arms from this one, and six torsos seem to be missing here and there. And then from the mayor's father's grave, the head is missing, and there's a head missing from this other grave also. It's very peculiar. Ultimately, the party tracks down the Cretan and then has to do battle with his newly created abomination. Maybe this person even loses control of it, not really realizing what they're creating, and it runs amok on the town and the party is the one who has to stop it, maybe even in conjunction with the necromancer. Ultimately, these guys have a lot of story potential, I feel, and they're much more than just your run-of-the-mill skeleton. But that is all I've really got to say about these creatures today, so if you have actually used one of these in the past, or maybe you've had one used on you, or maybe you've got some ideas for how you would like to implement this in a game, please tell me about it in the comments below, I'd love to hear about it. I was already chatting with some of the patrons on the Discord server about this creature, and some of them had some really neat ideas about, like, a giant variant that was made with giant skeletons, and that would be absolutely terrifying, stuff like that, so I really do enjoy hearing what you guys come up with. And speaking of my patrons, if you happen to be one of them, you can find the premium style monster manual like stat block on the Patreon page. And if you are not one of my patrons and you would like to use this creature, do not worry, you can still get all of the stats for this creature that you can use. It's not as fancy schmancy, but there is a Google document in the description on this video below where you can find everything you'll need to run this creature successfully in your game. And while you're down there, you can find me on Twitter, Discord, Facebook, all that good stuff. Whatever you use, I'm probably on it. And other than that, I just want to say thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. And if you have any suggestions for monsters you'd like to see me cover, maybe you have a favorite monster from 4th edition or AD&D or whatever it is, just leave a comment below. Tell me about it. I will do some investigation and we'll see you in the next video. Until then.